so it's wonderful. And the best news is our speaker arrived. <laughs> Otherwise, we would be doing oral histories. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Susan, do you want to come up? Are you in the back drinking, Susan? <laughs> As a matter of fact, I was drinking, Mary. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh. Well, good evening, everybody. There kind of seems to be a bit of a pattern here. If you served in the Navy, can you please stand? Well, that's okay. Or raise your hand. Okay. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. I wish I had one there. And how about those who served in other branches? Do we have others that served in other branches? Please raise your hand or stand. Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I'm, well, before I start talking, test, test. Great. Or my mic right now. Great. Thank you for being here and thank you for your service. We have a wonderful program tonight, and so we can get started with that. And I'll, in, as you all know, Mary, um, she will introduce our speaker. And Mary Madden is the director of the museum and director of education. So here we go. Thanks, Susan, and thank you all for showing up tonight. Um, we try and provide as much confusion as possible in getting the word out about what our programs are. Um, so only the intelligent people showed up. The rest of the people were just all confused, right? Uh, if you read the paper this week, they put the wrong ad in in the beginning. and. Some of us had a little indigestion, and then the paper agreed to run really big ads in replacing it. But then, to add to that, you know, we didn't have any program changes for the first two years. In the last four months, we've had like three. So I, maybe we're done with it. But please pick up a new flyer because our June speaker was to be Dr. Janet Valentine. She had a family emergency, and we have replaced her with a woman who is going to to speak on uh, suffrage in the 19th Amendment, which is very timely because we're in the middle of the 100th anniversary. So please pick up a flyer. It is my pleasure <laughs> to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. John Kuhn. Um, he is a professor at the, mil he's of military history at the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College, which is our favorite place to get speakers. Um, but he wanted to make sure that you all knew that he is a proud veteran of McEachran Elementary. <laughs> <laughs> His father was here um, working as a Menninger Fellow from 1961 to 64, and yes, I'm sure that that first kindergarten, first grade just set you your trajectory to greatness. <laughs> His topic tonight is the Naval War in Vietnam. Dr. Kuhn offers insight into the role of the U.S. Navy in the Vietnam War. The Navy supported the conflict in Vietnam from the Gulf of Tonkin incident to the final frantic evacuation of 1975. Little known Vietnam War maritime operations such as Market Time and Sea Lord highlight advantages gained during the war through the U.S. de facto command of the air and sea. So please join me tonight in welcoming our speaker, Dr. Kuhn. Thank you very much for that, for that very gracious introduction. Can you all hear me pretty good? Okay. Yeah, I, when we left Topeka in 1964, for me as a... Uh, as a six-year-old kid, it was a catastrophe because I, I love Topeka, and uh, we lived right in the shadow of Burnett's Mound. And then, of course, the year after we moved to Indiana, they had that big tornado that came through and kind of wiped out that area. Um, but our house actually survived it. And uh, and when I came back to uh, Fort Leavenworth, uh, uh, twenty. 
23 years ago, when I came to Fort Leavenworth as a student at CGSOC, I brought my family out to see where I'd lived in Burnett's Mountain and everything, and they were like, we can't even believe you remembered how to find it. So, um, so I have a pretty good memory. Um, yeah, my dad was a Manager Fellow, and he was a doctor in the Navy. Uh, so he was, in the, he was in the Navy during the war as a Medical Corps reservist. He never went to Nam, but uh, he was involved uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the debrief uh, as a, a Navy psychiatrist for the guys coming back from the Hanoi Hilton. When the, POW, when the POWs were repatriated. And, and I can still remember that. We were in San Diego at the time, and he was, he was doing all that out at Point Loma in San Diego. And uh, I, I kind of followed in my dad's footsteps. I joined the Navy in 1981, and uh, I was a naval aviator, naval flight officer, and, uh, and so I served from 81 until 2003. So uh, I, was in, uh, I was in a really small community, the VQ community. We flew uh, EP3s and... Uh, and, uh, and then I switched over to another VQ platform, the, uh, which was an uh, ES3. So I've got both land and carrier-based experience. So I, I can kind of talk both the land-based aviation and carrier-based aviation. Now, this is just kind of an icebreaker up here. Um, <clears throat> so I grew up during the Vietnam War, like a lot of you did. And some of you grew up in the war, because you were in the war. Um, so, uh, so I can remember that time period and how cathartic it was for us as Americans. Um, and, and so with the recent uh, Ken Burns series, I, I think a lot more people have a, a more nuanced understanding of what was going on in Vietnam. But I want to take a look at it from the aspect of, uh, of, of naval warfare, uh, maritime warfare, and joint warfare. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm going to kind of focus on sort of the, the, the big moving parts uh, that had to do more with the ships and the boats than, than with the airplanes. Uh, we had, uh, I might mention the aviation piece, uh, and maybe I can take some questions about the aviation piece, although uh, I haven't prepared terribly a whole lot for what to talk about with respect to Yankee Station and all of that. But, uh, but I know enough about it because I, I had friends uh, in the Navy when I first came into the Navy. They had served in Vietnam. Uh, we had a lot of we had a lot of lieutenant commanders in my first squadron, and all of them had, were Vietnam vets. All of them were Vietnam vets. And, uh, um, and they, uh, they had a lot of tales to tell. Most of the flying that those guys did, though, uh, was shore-based, and it was out of Da Nang. So most of those guys were out of Da Nang. So, so I, I actually had some direct experience. My first missions as a naval aviator were off the coast of Vietnam, uh, flying uh, reconnaissance missions against the big Soviet base at Cameron Bay. So anybody who thinks that Vietnam wasn't a serious, serious blow to the United States strategically, all you had to do was get in your uh, EP-3 and fly off of Cameron Bay, which uh, we built up and we built all the infrastructure and the BOQ and, and the airfield and proved it and everything there. And the Soviets, our Soviet counterparts, were living in the quarters that we had occupied only a few years before. And a couple of the pilots who used to fly said, hey, you know, I, I just irks me that some commie is living in my BOQ room. Okay, so, all right, enough of course sort of introductory comments. Um, yeah, we don't know our history very well, do we? We don't know our history very well. well let me go back. So this is my agenda. Again, I want to, I'm a, I'm a naval historian. That's my primary specialty, all right? Um, and that's mostly what I've published on. Uh, and I'm really not a Vietnam Navy specialist so much as I'm a 20th century naval specialist. And, uh, and in particular, my, my area is World War II and the period between World War II and uh, World War I, the interwar period. So, so I'm, a, I'm, I'm kind of an expert on that area. But, uh, but I am also, because I'm a naval historian, I have to know about naval theory. And naval theory starts with this guy, Alfred Thayer Mahan. So I'll kind of say, what did he say about it? And you'll get a little free, uh, free lecture on, uh, on naval theory, just for the price of entry here. Uh, we'll go to the Gulf of Tonkin incident. That's, that's the official sort of thing that elevates uh, the Vietnam conflict or the Vietnam uh, 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 assistance mission from what is sort of what we might call counterinsurgency into uh, major theater conventional warfare and operations with the uh, with the uh, 
uh, with the escalation and the commitment of major ground combat forces and major sea and air combat forces to the fight uh, in the air, on the land, and off the coasts of Vietnam. Uh, from there, we'll go to market time. We'll talk a little bit about the surge in the Mekong that takes place, uh, and Game Warden, and then Sea Lords. So hopefully you'll learn a little bit of something. And again, if there's something I've got wrong, I'm, I'll be, I'd love to uh, revise this to make this more accurate. History is an interesting thing. It's a narrative, but it's a narrative that's told from many different perspectives. And so the more that we can improve the narrative uh, for everybody, I think the better we can understand from history. I don't believe in learning lessons from history, but I do believe in studying it to gain wisdom and insight. So we'll, we'll do that. And then Sea Lords is the last thing. And that's got my hero in it, uh, Admiral Zumwalt. Okay. So what would Mahan say? Well, Mahan, Mahan the, the basis of Mahan's grand strategic approach to problems was to look at geography. And he always liked to look at the intersection of blue stuff with brown, green, gray, whatever stuff, right? And so he would look at South Vietnam as a problem uh, that lends itself well to the application of naval power. Uh, it's got an extensive coastline, all right? And if the enemy is using that to transport stuff, you can blockade it if you've got a big enough navy. Um, if the uh, enemy has forces uh, that you can reach with naval gunfire, and remember, we're talking about a navy that has battleships with 16-inch guns that can reach uh, that can reach actually all the way to Quezon uh, in the north. So, so you you can project some pretty heavy-duty firepower inland from ships, and so there'll be a lot of ships that serve on the gun line in Vietnam, and uh, and so you'll have this overwhelming firepower advantage. Uh, in, in, the, in the littoral area of the country. Uh, you can also put floating aircraft, uh, air, uh, air bases out there that have the engines, they call those aircraft carriers, and those mobile floating air bases can bomb stuff, all right? So it, uh, it really lends itself well to the application of naval power. It's got a lot of rivers, particularly in the south, that's gonna lend itself well particularly to a Navy that's got a history of sort of excelling at riverine ops in the Civil War, all right? And uh, <clears throat> the enemy has ports and things that can be, uh, can be blockaded up here as well, all right? And, uh, and, and if you try to sneak in supplies through neutral Cambodia, uh, you could conceivably blockade Cambodia if you wanted to take that measure. Of course, what we're going to find is Vietnam's going to be a limited war, all right? And so some of these options are going to be removed from the table, not by the enemy, but by us to limit the war. Um, the other thing from a geographic standpoint of Vietnam is this is not a coast. And that will be the problem of Vietnam, which is that you can isolate it with naval power, but you can't isolate it completely with naval power. All right, so, so Mahan would like it. Mahan would like it a whole lot better if it was a peninsula like Korea, all right? And when President Johnson, President Kennedy, not so much President Nixon, look at Vietnam, they're thinking Korea. They're thinking if we don't, if we don't if we don't limit this war, we're going to get another Korean War, we're going to get the Chinese involved, and it's going to end up as a stalemate, and we won't win. All right. So, so those are some of the sort of grand strategic considerations from a Mahanian point of view. Now obviously, if you're going to exercise maritime power out here in the maritime domain, the sea and air and undersea domain, because you can mine things, so you can put stuff under the water too, and that will actually be something that takes place in the Vietnam War during linebacker one and two. But uh, um, you have to control that. We're very fortunate. The, uh, the Russians who are, are, and the Chinese who are supportive of North Vietnam and of the, uh, of the NLF and, and, the, and the Viet Cong in the South are not going to contest our command of the sea. So we're going to have absolute command of the sea in this scenario. And a big lesson learned there is you can have absolute command of the sea and not win. All right? Same thing is true of absolute command of the air. We don't have absolute command of the air. For, for most of the war, we, we have what they would call limited air superiority, but the Vietnamese will challenge that 
uh, they'll challenge it in a number of uh, ways. And I'm not going to talk much about that tonight, about rolling thunder and linebacker. All right. So, yeah, this is the, this comes from uh, Mahan's counterpart over in Britain, uh, Sir Julian Corbett. Um, and naval warfare is imminently suited to limited warfare. Uh, they began uh, participating in, in uh, the Naval Air Forces of the United States, began participating in combat over Vietnam. Yes, ma'am. Can you read the slides for the Okay, sure. Let's go back. So, uh, I like it. All right. <laughs> limited war is only... See, they train us not to read the slides at Fort Leavenworth. Yeah. So, limited war is only permanently possible between powers which are separated by sea, and then only when the power desiring the limited war is able to command the sea. Vietnam is separated from the United States by the sea, by a huge one, the Pacific. And, uh, and the United States that wants to limit the war does have command of the sea. Sir Julian Corbett. Oh, boy, this thing goes crazy if you punch it too hard, doesn't it? Uh, Naval Air Forces began uh, participating, and again, I'm, I'm going to limit my discussion there, but I did want to acknowledge this is a big contribution, but this is really about the air war, okay? This is about the air war, and maybe we can bring me back or somebody else from SAMS or CGSC back here to talk about the air war in Vietnam, or maybe you guys have already done that, but the air war deserves its own lecture, all right? But, uh, so, so we've already got aircraft in combat, and obviously we have the folks from the military assistant group, which became the military military assistance command Vietnam that have already been in combat in Vietnam since at least 1959. Although the really, the really big deal with combat operations really starts to begin in what I call the dark year and that's, uh, that's uh, 1963 which is, which is really, the, really the worst year uh, in Vietnam until we intervene in a big way. In fact, Vietnam pretty much is a lost cause by the end of like 1963 because uh, because of the uh, of what happens with uh, the assassinations of uh, President Ngo Dinh Diem and President Kennedy, right? Uh, most of those missions are covert missions. Americans don't know they're going on. Uh, the other thing that's going on too is supposedly the Vietnamese pilots, the South Vietnamese pilots flying for the government of Vietnam are, are flying the missions and the American pilots are only advising, but actually the American pilots are actually flying a lot of these missions. Okay, the pretext for intervention occurs in uh, the Gulf of Tonkin, all right, Haiphong is up here, um, and we're still not sure what happened. I think. Johnson probably got it right. For all I know, our Navy was shooting at whales out there. Uh, there, there were about four or five different operations going on uh, at the time. Uh, there were a couple of U.S. destroyers out there that had specific orders to do certain things. There were uh, uh, Arvin troops. There were CIA. Um, and there was a lot of confusion. It was a typical sort of chaotic situation. What ended up happening, though, is we get a pretext to intervene in the war, something that we call a casus belli. And again, one of the reasons it's in my brief is, where does it occur? At sea, all right? So the pretext for us to intervene in the Vietnam War is not something that happened ashore. It's actually something that happened out in the waters off Vietnam. Uh, an, an illegal attack as it's framed, and, and Johnson, President Johnson doesn't go to Congress for a declaration of war, but he gets this. Oops. The Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. This is like what we have right now, the authorization to use military force. It's a blank check for the presidents to use military force. Okay? And we got one of those in place right now that we passed after 9-11. Okay? Um, so yeah, so we've got the joint resolution from Congress saying, hey, do whatever it does to promote international peace and security in Southeast Asia. And so that's the blank check. Okay, well job number one, let's interdict the Ho Chi Minh Trail at sea. So prior to the United States intervention in 1965, the bulk of the material coming from North Vietnam and supplying the Viet Cong and the National Liberation Front is coming via trawlers and junks via the sea. Not well known. I don't even know if Ken Burns had that in his movie, all right? 
but he didn't talk to me. He talked to my boss, Jim Wilbanks. So, uh, so the bulk of that stuff is coming via the sea. It's also coming in some of it, not a whole lot of it, via uh, Cambodia, via uh, Port Sienicville uh, in Cambodia. All right. And then once you get the supplies down to this part of Vietnam, they can be distributed in the delta, in the Mekong Delta, on little boats and sampans. And it's a very difficult problem, all right? So that's the first thing to do, is to cut off the flow of this material through the seas. Maritime interdiction, the problem is recognized early that it would require special riverine craft that yeah, we can interdict with deep water ships further out to sea, but the enemy's just gonna go closer and closer and closer. And as all you sailors out there know, all of us sailors know, the shallower and shallower the draft you get, the smaller and smaller the boat is probably gonna have to be at some point, okay? Unless it's an LST, but LSTs, and they'll use LSTs in the Riverine War, by the way. Um, so that's a landing ship tank, like the stuff that you see at D-Day. So, but they knew they'd need specialized boats, so the swift boats have already been ordered by May 1964. Uh, the idea is to equip the South Vietnamese Navy with these boats and let them do the job. Because remember, we haven't intervened with major combat forces yet in 1964. And so we get, uh, we get as I discussed, Cameron Bay gets built up, and Da Nang gets built up, and we start to have all this massive infrastructure and construction, while at the same time we're working with the various maritime and marine corporations in the United States to come up with a suitable riverine craft to do the mission. As usual, the Americans are going to kind of kind of make it up as they go until they get what they need, all right? So you'll see a lot of ships that get repurposed. That's what we say in the military. They get repurposed to do riverine warfare, even though they're not designed. Uh, as with everything in uh, Vietnam, uh, it's, uh, events are going to outpace policy. So what takes place on the ground and on the sea is normally going to outpace the policy the decisions get made. So we're constantly playing catch up to get, try to get the right equipment, the right training, the right forces and everything on hand to do what we're gonna do at sea. There's a one year delay uh, on the Cambodian interdiction, so we don't interdict anything going into Cambodia for a year, and that's, that's gonna hurt us because that's gonna allow the Vietnamese to build up these big supply dumps, or the North Vietnamese and their Viet Cong allies to build up big supply dumps in Cambodia. Okay, so the first big event in this war is the, Vo, uh, the Vung Ro Bay incident, February 1965. So what we want to do is we want to interdict a ship that's supporting uh, the, the Viet Cong. It's a 180 ton ship, pretty big ship, all right? Uh, to give you an idea how big 180 tons is though, compared to like uh, an Arleigh Burke destroyer, it's about the tenth of a size of an Arleigh Burke destroyer. So an Arleigh Burke destroyer is uh, bigger than 10,000 tons, all right? So today's destroyers are much, much bigger than that. But that's still, that's still a substantial uh, piece of metal floating in the water. Um, one of the problems is that we find out right away is the, the, Viet, the Republic of Vietnam Navy is not an independent service. It's subordinate to a bunch of landlubbers, to the Army, okay? That's not unusual. I mean, if we look at what's going on in China today, the People's Liberation Army Navy is the Navy of China. For a long, long time, it was subordinate to the Army. It's now an independent service, but it's not the PLN, the People's Liberation Navy, it's the People's Liberation Army Navy. So this is kind of the way they do things. Uh, the father of the Japanese Navy, for example, Army General, okay? So, so this is not unusual in Asia to have the Navy subordinate to, uh, to the Army. So that's a command and control problem. And during this incident, that's part of the problem here. The U.S. advisors are ignored. So the U.S. advisors that are trying to train them how to do interdiction, remember, we're trying to put a Vietnamese face on this, uh, they're being essentially ignored. Uh, the, uh, the Vietnamese special forces are brought in to help with this. They're insubordinate. They kind of go their own way and do their own thing. Um, and then the sailors and the soldiers aren't, aren't ready for prime time. They're, they're not very professional. They're very indisciplined. And so it's sort of a, it's sort of a black eye. It's a, it's a big sort of a catastrophe. There's lots of casualties. 
Um, and we had a, a minimal Coast Guard. We got any Coasties in the room? Any Coast Guard guys here in the room? Yeah, we had a Coast Guard uh, uh, footprint there. Coast Guard, when we, go, when we go to war, the Coast Guard comes under the Navy. But the Coast Guard was actually, the U.S. Coast Guard was actually more effective in terms of the numbers of boats interdicted and the, and the amount of, of Vietnamese war material being seized than the Vietnamese Navy was, at least in 1960, early 1965. March 1965, we get uh, the Marines landing uncontested near Da Nang. Okay, so we get the Marines coming into Da Nang. And PACOM is under this guy named U Admiral U.S. Grant Sharp. What a name, huh? U.S. Grant Sharp. Uh, Sharp is essentially the naval commander of all the forces in Vietnam. It's interesting because he shouldn't be. It should be Seventh Fleet. But he's sort of the guy calling the shots, all right? He decides to appoint this guy, Rear Admiral Norvell G. Ward. Uh, and later, it's a guy named Ken Veff. And this essentially becomes an independent command, all right? And those of you familiar with command and control, this, this is not making sense. Like, if you ever first served in Seventh Fleet like I have, somebody would ask you, well, who's your boss? And I'd go, well, my boss is my squadron commander. Well, who's his boss? Well, it's the wing commander. Who's his boss? The Seventh Fleet commander. That's not how this works. Uh, Ward is pretty much responsible directly to the p commander of the Pacific Command. He doesn't work for William Westmoreland, who's the commander of the Military Assistant Command, General Westmoreland. Um, and he doesn't work for the Seventh Fleet commander. He's really an independent commander. If I had a line and diary, sometimes I'll put a line, line chart up there, but I didn't want to bore you guys with a line chart. I figure I could talk about it qualitatively. So Ward comes up with three operations. The first thing he says is we're going to have to, we're going to, have to take over this job, right? Now that we've got the Gulf of Tonkin res resolution, we're going to have sailors doing this. And yeah, we'll, the, so the training mission for the Vietnamese Navy becomes a secondary mission. The primary mission is to cut that Ho Chi Minh Trail at sea. So that's the primary mission. And if you guys, if I'm getting low on time, just give me the high five and I'll speed things up. So the first operation is going to be Operation Market Time. All right? Operation Market Time. Another one of Ward's operations is going to be Game Warden. And then after Ward leaves, uh, we're going to get this mobile, re mobile river reinforce, which is an Army, Navy sort of conglomeration down in the Mekong Delta. And then later we'll get Sea Lords, which, is, which belongs to Admiral Zumwalt. Market time is the one I want to talk about first. Uh, it starts with Operation Stable Door. And, uh, and uh, again, this is back in the day when we didn't have all these flashy names for operations. I mean, if we were going to name this today, Operation Market Time would probably be Operation Shut the Door, right? And, and Operation Stable Door would be like Operation Slam the Door, you know? So, so Market Time, uh, first operation is, and he creates a coastal, so first we got to figure out what we got. We got to build a picture. We've got a, that's what we do in the Navy. We get these CICs and we build a picture. So Ward builds a picture of what the traffic is, where the sites are, where the onload sites are, where the offload sites are. Of course, there's not much he can do about the onload sites in North Vietnam, all right? But, uh, but so he establishes Stable Door, and Stable Board's Door is just, hey, we're going to watch, collect data, and figure out what we got. That's followed by the main part of market time. It's implemented after the sort of catastrophe at Vung Ro Bay. And again, uh, most of the supplies, Westmoreland says, hey, our estimates here in the Army intel side of things is most, and I'll call Westmoreland Westy sometimes, because I like that nickname for him. Most of the supplies are coming by sea. And, and Ward goes, got it, boss, got it, boss. Um, the enemy used trawlers and junks, OK? And the enemy is a combination of South Vietnamese and North Vietnamese. Uh, no Chinese. The Chinese really kind of stay out of this. Uh, it's really the Vietnamese sort of a deal. Um, and, and criminals, too. They'll hire sort of some of these criminal gangs that exist in Vietnam to help them out with some of this stuff. Uh, the Viet they decide the junks are easier to interdict, they're slower, they're less maneuverable, so we're going to send the Vietnamese Navy after the junks with advisors on board. The U.S. Navy is going to go after the seagoing trawlers and the larger vessels. 
So they sort of give the easy fish to the Vietnamese and they give the, uh, the harder stuff to the Navy. Um, finally, after the operation is already underway for a couple months, they move it under 7th Fleet. Um, and so that kind of solves part of the command and control problem. But Grant is still sort of running the show. And kind of 7th Fleet is sort of the man in the middle who's like, you know, my boss is talking to my subordinate, but I'm not sure what's going on here. And, uh, you know, so he's kind of the odd man out. Uh, in March 65, again, that's when it begins. Before it started, estimated 75% of the Viet Cong insurgents logistics. Let me say that again. Uh, before uh, this, the blockade starts and the interdiction starts, estimated 75% of the Viet Cong's logistics are coming by sea. Okay, so that's for the Viet Cong. It's not so much for the North Vietnamese Army, because the North Vietnamese Army, remember the map? They're way inland on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Okay, so they're not getting as much supply by sea as the Viet Cong, but the Viet Cong are getting the bulk of their supplies by sea. Okay, yeah, so one reason the NVA isn't as affected is because their logistics are coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, right? So their logistic lines are already, now they're, they haven't really built the full up Ho Chi Minh Trail yet because they're getting so much accomplished at sea, all right? So you can always tell if you're having an effect on your enemy if he has to change his supply lines, all right? And, uh, and so that's one way we're going to be able to measure whether market time is successful. Again, when you look at these numbers, you're like, boy, that's not a lot of numbers to cover that amount of coast. That's a lot of coast. So we started out with two old kind of Fram class DDs, all right, Sumner class DDs. Uh, and we eventually increased that to 10 destroyers, all right? Um, as, the, as it continues, they realize these things are too deep draft and they start to use some of the older destroyer escorts and destroyer mine layers that have a little bit shallower draft. Some of them left over from World War II and then the Coast Guard brings eight of its cutters in to help. All right, so, so you know, we're starting to get a pretty healthy force here to do this blockade. Um, they come in the middle of 65, they bring in aircraft. They, I used to fly in EP3s. Uh, VP is a P3, so it doesn't have all the electronic surveillance gear, but it's got guys with eyeballs and radios and radars and binoculars. And so uh, VP aircraft join the effort um, and they start to help identify uh, interdiction platforms and then contact the ships, vector in the ships to, uh, to uh, interdict the ships, seize their uh, war material and cut it off. Okay. Uh, Ward, even though Ward had been, a, been appointed earlier, he sort of assumes full control of everything by August 1965. Summation. By late 67, the forces numbered over 70 vessels, and on their best days, they were interdicting 1,500 vessels a day. Think about that. Now, I checked that number. Because I was like, I had to go to my boss, Jim Wilbanks, who's an expert on the Vietnam War. You probably remember he's sort of the cantankerous Texan in the Ken Burns documentary. And I said, Jim, is this number right? And he goes, it sure is, John. So, yeah. So I was, I was surprised. That, that, that is a lot of work. So that's some really hard work. Think about all the cargoes on those vessels that didn't get into the hands of the Viet Cong. All right? Essentially, they cut the sea lines of communication. They cut it off. It dries up. By, six, by the end of 67, that's dried off. Okay? Extremely effective. Two years to really do it. The problem is the enemy will reroute the supplies down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Okay? Now that's going to require a lot of effort on their part. It's also going to affect their timetable to win the war. They, they, with, the, uh, with the effectiveness and the success of the market time blockade, the, the Politburo in Hanoi goes, rats, we're not going to win this war anytime soon. Because now we're going to have to bring everything by the much slower, laborious method through the jungle. We're going to have to build roads, which the Americans can bomb. Uh, and uh, we're going to have to beef up the Ho Chi Minh Trail. We're also going to see if we can send more stuff through uh, Cambodia. All right? The, it was always a controversial operation. All right? 
uh, because you're infringing on the waters of countries that, like Cambodia or North Vietnam for that matter, that you've kind of set her off limits. Uh, also, it's supposed to be the Vietnamese doing this, not the Americans doing this. So it's something of a controversial operation. But from a strictly military point of view, it's extremely effective. Extremely effective. It's one of the big successes of the Vietnam War that gets no airplay. Because it's out to sea, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. Okay? Um, the bulk of this material did not originate in factories in North Vietnam. It originated in factories in the People's Republic of China and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, our friends, the Soviet Union. So yeah, they, most of it, when they capture the equipment, it was like always AK-47s, RPGs, mortars, stuff like that. Uh, some, some, some artillery, lots of ammunition, lots of food. Food's a big deal too. Okay. Yeah, so this is the response to market time. We don't have a Ho Chi Minh Trail at sea. We're going to try to push more through Cambodia. This is why Cambodia is going to start to cause more and more problems for the United States. Um, and, and, and we'll get to the point after Tet where Cambodia is off limits. And so we won't be able to interdict major Soviet ships coming into Cambodia. And that'll, that'll really hurt us, all right? Uh, but that hasn't really taken place yet. Uh, but what this will mean is that material is going to flow this way into the Viet Cong through the Mekong Delta and then down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. But it takes time to develop those, to move, to store, to hide, because again, once it gets inside South Vietnam, the Americans and the South Vietnamese and their allies can attack it. So we got to go to the rivers and go back, okay? This is all cut off. We still got naval ships out here that can support operations. For example, at the Battle of Wei in 1968, you'll have destroyers providing naval gunfire support during the Siege of Wei. Um, you'll actually have a naval amphibious group there that helps the army cross the river to the Perfume River to get into Wei. But, uh, but for the Navy, the big thing now is the supplies coming from here and from here are flowing down the Mekong Delta into the areas of the insurgency down here, and so we've got to stop those. The best place to stop them is right here. This is called the Iron Triangle. That's the place to stop them, all right? And there hasn't been a lot of activity there because there hasn't been a lot of need to have a lot of activity there. But with the success of market time, we have to do a surge. So we have to go to the rivers, all right? Um, here's two of the main coins of the realm. The, there's the uh, PCF, uh, Swift Boat uh, game. That's Warden, that's what those, they, they, eventually everybody called everything swift boats, but not all swift boats are created equal, okay? So, so this was sort of early in the program, looks a lot like a PT boat, uh, maybe with a little bit too high of a profile. But this was the specially designed swift boats, the PBRs, that, uh, that they'll eventually use. And, and they make a modification because they find out the mud and the silt and everything that exists in the, uh, in the, in the Mekong was garbaging up the intakes for the, for, the, for, the newer, for the older boats, for the first generation of boats. So they actually go to an American company and design a boat with jacuzzi intakes, which can handle the silt and process it out. And that makes these uh, really good. But they're only good for about six months months, okay? So, you know, you've got these payoffs between, hey, we, the, yeah, the engine's going to make the boat really effective, but after about six months, you know, we got to get a new boat or a new engine, usually a new engine. But when you get a new engine, what does that mean? The boat's out of service, okay? Go to the rivers. So the first operation on the rivers is Game Warden. Uh, the genesis is with a guy named Paul Nitza. Now, if you don't know who Paul Nitze is, you should. Paul Nitze is one of the most important people in American history from World War II until a couple years ago when he died. He served as Secretary of the Navy for a while, but he's most famous for writing the doctrine of containment and deterrence known as NSC-68, the militarized containment doctrine. He takes George Kennan's containment doctrine. But Nitze is a naval guy. And so, so Nitze is the guy who says, hey, we got to get this going. And his aide is this bright young Navy captain named Elmo Zumwalt, 
who had been a destroyer guy in World War II, a very, very talented, bright man, he was friends with Kennan, was friends with, with Nitza. And, uh, and so Nitza and uh, Zumwalt said, hey, we got to get on the rivers. Uh, once they see the numbers go up, in early 66, they create this Task Force 116. And maybe to make it more understandable to you guys, what they do is a surge. They surge the riverine forces up into the Mekong Delta to try to catch the equipment before it gets down the rivers to the Viet Cong and then is cached away in hiding places and storage places. Okay. And for some reason, the Vietnamese are trying to build up all these supplies. And the Americans are like, we're not sure what that, why they're doing that. Because we're not seeing a lot of operations. We're seeing a lot of supplies, right? What they're doing is they're trying to build up for the war, for the war of national liberation. The Ngoi Kia, right? The national uprising, all right? And they won't get enough supplies until late 1967. And then they'll launch the national uprising on the Tet holiday in the early new Lunar New Year in 1968. So that's one of the reasons that we're seeing all these supplies, but we're not seeing them being used. They're being hidden away and cached for later use. Okay? So they started uh, in, early, in early 66 to really ramp up. Uh, they started out with 100 uh, PBRs and P PCFs. This is a landing craft, uh, 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 kind of a light landing craft. They had a lot of those. They actually, remember I said they used landing ship tanks from like D-Day? They had one of those bad boys that they had in the rivers. Uh, they had a landing ship dock. That could only operate in the more uh, deeper parts of the Mekong Delta. And they started to use helicopters. So this becomes a three-dimensional ground, air, sea sort of thing, right? And eventually we'll bring the army into it. And the army will create a force to, that, that will be a, a riverine support and assault force. So we'll get, we'll get more and more ground power to kind of help kind of open things up. So that's Game Warden. And, uh, and it's a surge. Uh, Zumwalt said, the problem here is we don't have any doctrine. The last time we had any doctrine for riverine warfare was in the Philippine insurgency. And nobody saved that, all right? If you don't know about the Philippine insurgency, it occurred, in, uh, it occurred in, uh, from the Spanish-American War until about 1906. Some people said it never ended. I would be one of those. Because when I got to the Philippines in 1983, I flew missions against Philippine insurgents, all right? So uh, anyway, they, uh, but the doctrine wasn't saved, right? So there had been no saved doctrine. So, uh, so we had to make it up as we went along. How does, does this really sound American? Well, make it up as we go along. We'll take, a, we'll take this jacuzzi-powered boat. We'll take a couple young drafted Americans. Actually, a lot of these guys are volunteers. Okay? Why were they volunteers and not draftees? There were some draftees. Don't get me wrong. But why were they volunteers and not draftees? A lot of guys volunteered to join the Navy so they wouldn't have to serve in the Army in Vietnam. And then they got sent to the swift boats. Okay? So, yeah. So, so there was... But you know what? Once you get over there, you got your buddies on the boat with you, you, you want to protect your buddies, right? And so, and particularly, this is small unit warfare. This isn't lots of big moving parts. You know, you've got a, a, a chief petty officer or a first class petty officer, maybe a young ensign, maybe a JG if you're lucky in charge of this boat. Okay, so these are pretty junior personnel. And they're given a lot of leeway to kind of do things the way they see fit, you know, like John Kerry, all right? So they made it up as they went along, all right? Um, <laughs> I had to get that in there. It was very effective. Okay, do you see a theme here? It's very, but lots of casualties. We're starting to, because so, when you surge, just like when we surged in Iraq, you get more casualties, okay? So, because the enemy's going to fight back. When the enemy fights back, you know you're being effective, all right? When the enemy stands and fights, you've probably done something right. Because in Vietnam, the enemy didn't want to fight. They wanted to choose the place and the time of the fight. They didn't want us to pick. Well, with, with Game Warden, we picked the place and the time of the fight. And that place and time was in the Mekong Delta. And they had to fight for it or they weren't going to get their supplies. And then they wouldn't be able to launch the, the uh, National Uprising Offensive. And, you know, they might as well give up, right? Uh, destroyed or captured over 2,000 Viet Cong vessels. 
all right? And this is in the space of about 18 months. VC casualties, body count, confirmed, 1,400. Probably a lot more. What's not up there? Collateral damage. What's collateral damage? Civilian casualties, okay? Again, we're on, we're on rivers. I, hey, who's ever been to Louisiana or been through the Delta in, in, in Mississippi or lived in Florida, you know, before it got all developed? You know, these are, these are, these are swamps. It's easy to kind of, it's hard to target things there. It's hard to get eyes on target. And, uh, and so, so these guys uh, were kind of forced to make some very, very hard decisions. But yeah, they're, they, so you did get a lot of uh, death, destruction, and mayhem. But you also did a pretty successful job interdicting the buildup. Uh, Hanoi can't launch the offensive in 67. And they can't do it. It really undercuts their ability to do that, along with what the Army is doing with its operations, uh, Cedar Falls and some of these other big operations. They really undercut the ability to kind of, for the, for the VC and the NVA to go over to the offensive, which they want to do. They want to go to the offensive, but they can't, all right? M modest success? Well, I don't know. Pfft. Doesn't look like it. But you can only cover so much ground. So supplies are getting through. So it's unlike the blockade at sea, they don't cut off all the supplies. Some supplies still get through. They figure out new ways of doing business. We need something else. The enemy also adjusted their routes. The enemy said, okay, you're interdicting the main lines. We're going to... And so what the enemy did was they moved the... Uh, let me go back to the map to kind of show you what they did. So what the enemy did was, Game Warden came in here and really interdicted effectively about this far in. They moved the debarkation points for the supplies closer to the Cambodian border, and in some cases, inside the Cambodian border. Okay? So they started to offload the vessels either inside the Cam... Of course, the further you lo offloaded it, the farther it had to go by land, right? And eventually, it would have to cross into Vietnam. So that's what they did. Uh, we, uh, today, I think we call these things rat lines. But they, they developed new rat lines to feed the stuff in. But they moved it to the northwest, uh, up to this area here, which is sometimes called the Iron Triangle. Okay. Just as the enemy is adjusting everything, Hanoi says, we can't wait anymore, we're going to launch the Tet Offensive, all right? And the Mobile, Mobile River Reinforce, Force, which has been operating now for uh, over two years, um, is ready. And it kind of comes into its own. But we don't hear much about it, all right, in the histories. We don't see it. We see the Battle of Wei, right? Or we see Quang Tri, or we see the attack on the embassy in Saigon. We, we see the, the siege of Quezon, right? We don't see what happens in the Delta with the Riverine Force. Um, and uh, they're the only offensive reserve available as all these guys get pinned down by this you know, offensive by the Viet Cong. The, all the Viet Cong guerrillas aggregate and attack all of the major provinces in Vietnam and some of the minor provincial cities they attack as well. Um, remember, the bulk of the people in Vietnam are in the Mekong Delta in South Vietnam. That's really the center of gravity. If you're going to win as an insurgent in Vietnam, you got to win in the Mekong Delta. If you don't win there, you're not going to win because that's where most of the people are. Remember, the whole idea here is to control the people. Once you get control of them and the enemy can't, you're going to win, right, with insurgent warfare, okay? So the Riverine Force is placed under the MACV's command during Tet. They basically chop them to the army. Um, and because the Vietnamese came out of their hiding places, took their arms and ammunition out of the caches, the Riverine Force was part of the counteroffensive or the counter counterattacks against Tet or the defensive actions and then counterattacks. And the Viet Cong infrastructure in the Mekong was badly, badly damaged, pretty much by the riverine forces because they were so mobile and they could move around. But again, now they had targets that, that were easier to hit and everything. But again, 
the highest casualties are going to come during Tet and in something called Mini Tet, which takes place a little bit later in 1968. But the impact is, is it really kind of gives the Riverine Force kind of high visibility. And at this time, they want to put a new guy in command. So in 1964, they did a report on the Mekong Delta. This is the Delta, right? Called the Bucklew Report. And they said the best place to interdict the supplies flowing into the insurgency are on the Laotian borders and the Cambodian borders. Um, for the purposes of our thing, the Bucklow Report, and so they already knew this was probably the best place right up here. This, and they call it the triangle because of this little thing here sticking into Cambodia. Um, and so, so uh, the guy who initially helped come up with this idea, Captain Zumwalt, is put in charge of the effort. And he renames Game Warden Sea Lords. Sea Lords, okay? This is more a modern approach. This is not like, you know, cat gut or something. Like previous operations, they'd pick, you know, like clicker in hand or something. No, this, we're going we're gonna to lord, lord it over them at the, on, on the sea. It, maybe river lords would have been more descriptive of what actually took place. And uh, it, it actually stands for this, Southeast Asia Lake, Ocean, River, and Delta strategy, right? I think he wrote the word sea lords, and then he figured out, okay, what does each letter mean, okay? If I'm wrong about that, let me know. Uh, so this is Bud Zumwalt. Uh, Elmo Zumwalt's nickname was Bud. A very gregarious, voluble, friendly guy. Uh, people, uh, hardly anybody who ever worked with Zumwalt, unless it was a fellow admiral, uh, didn't like him, uh, particularly his subordinates. His subordinates loved him. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go by his memoir, um, uh, I should remember the name because I, I just used it in some research. It's really worth reading. It's not about Vietnam. It's really about after Vietnam and how he changed the Navy with the z -grams. But uh, And some people have bad memories of the z -grams, but he did a lot of good for the Navy with that. But in Vietnam, that's where he got his chops. He's with uh, Admiral Chun, who's right there. That's his counterpart in Sea Lords. He's the Vietnamese admiral who's going to work with him. Um, and, uh, and he always showed the utmost respect, so he's good at playing with others. He's good at working with his coalition partners. He's sort of the consummate political admiral, and he's not afraid to make hard decisions. One of those hard decisions is going to be tragic. So it's going to be a joint coalition effort, and we're going to push up. <laughs> This is fun. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with my hands. Okay, so we're going to push up into that right next to the Cambodian coast. That's where Sea Lords is going to make its money. Okay? And he also said, you know, we're not going to be in this war forever. You know, kind of like Apocalypse Now, you know, where Robert Duvall's sitting there going, someday this war is going to end, right? Zumwalt knows we really got to train the Vietnamese to take over this job. Because if we don't, we're going to be here forever, all right? So he creates these schools for the Vietnamese riverine sailors. Uh, Chan and Zumwalt do that. Um, after, this, after the fall of Saigon, I just put this on here. This is something that I learned in my research. The North and the Viet Cong avoided the Mekong Delta for several months. The Delta was so pacified by the time the North Vietnamese and the, and the National Liberation Front arrived in 1975, they decided not to go in there for a, a, several months and, and, and take control and say, hey, we're in charge now, because they, they were afraid. They, there was, they, that's how effective. And a lot of these guys are still there. They didn't make it out yet. Now a bunch of them will leave later in what we call the boat people migration in the mid to, to late 70s. But uh, initially, these guys are kind of left in place to kind of run things until finally the North uh, brought its forces into the Mekong and pacified the Mekong. That's a part of the Vietnam War that should, needs more study. Frankly, it needs more research. The pacification of the Mekong Delta by the so-called victorious North Vietnamese Army, okay? So maybe they didn't win in the spring of 1975. Maybe they, it took them all the way to 1976 before they pacified the Delta. All right, so there's, there's, this is what we're talking about here. That's where Sea Lords takes place. 
And again, it's highly effective and it becomes more and more an American Vietnamese operation. The Americans have already made the decision when we leave, we're going to leave all the boats. So the Vietnamese Navy is going to get all those guys. And this is kind of where the story ends. By 1970, with CORDS, the, the, the pacification program under blowtorch Bob Comer, because of the success of Sea Lords, um, the, the, the Mekong is pacified. They still are conducting interdiction operations, uh, but for the most part, the North Vietnamese go, we give up, and so they build their caches in Cambodia. And that's why the incursion into Cambodia took place in 1970. They weren't doing the arms dumps inside South Vietnam anymore. The reason they weren't doing it is, one, they had been pushed out. Two, when they tried to go back in, the locals didn't like them anymore. The locals were now in support of the government in Saigon. This is because the government in Saigon, I think it was in 1970 or 71, did land reform. What's land reform? They basically said, all, if you're a peasant and you live on your own land and you have your own rice paddy, you don't have to pay rent to a landlord anymore. Most of the landlords have left the country anyway, and we're basically, so what happened was President Thieu just reformed uh, the land ownership in Vietnam and he gave the bulk of the land to the peasants. All right, So that's another reason the Viet Cong kind of died on the vine, particularly in the Mekong. Particularly in the, so we actually win the insurgency in the Mekong Delta and the riverine force is a big part. Now I said Zumwalt had to make a tragic decision. In the heat of the battle here, he makes the decision to use defoliants along the rivers to better find the enemy and to better find the arms and weapons and caches. One of those defoliants is Agent Orange. And his son is serving in the riverine forces, gets exposed to the Agent Orange, and eventually dies from an Agent Orange-related cancer, I think. Okay, So he actually sacrifices his son. Um, when they asked him about it, it was interesting, his response. They said, well, if you had it to do again, would you do it again? He goes, based on what I knew at the time, and the success that I was getting, and the fact that I didn't know how dangerous this stuff was, yeah, I probably would. Okay? Yeah, I probably would. If I had hindsight and I knew all these things that were going to happen, no, I wouldn't. But at the time, I made the decision I thought would protect my sailors. So what if? Yeah, the Navy is out of there in 1973. We signed the Paris Accords January 1973. No more Navy, right? Yeah, but if the commies had started rolling down Highway 1, what would have happened if you'd had a battleship off the coast to blow up their tanks? Yeah? All right, so there's, there's some what-ifs here, you know? And how many sailors are you going to lose with a battleship against an armored division going down Highway 1? Not many, all right? Not many, particularly if you've got a carrier providing air cover. So... Um, there were some lost opportunities. This is, the, this is uh, New Jersey bombarding in Vietnam in 69. 69 was another year where, uh, of just intense fighting uh, by the North Vietnamese. And by the time we get to, to 1971, the Vietnam War has changed completely. It's no longer a counterinsurgency. It's really uh, an attempt by the North to conquer the South. The uh, North tries to recreate uh, its forces, particularly in the Mekong, which is what we're talking about. They're, they're largely unsuccessful. There will be, quote unquote, VC. Most of the time, it'll be a North Vietnamese guy that comes down, kidnaps some teenage sons, and, and then gets the locals to fight for him, or he'll kill the sons, right? Okay. So there's a lot of that kind of going on. A lot of this terrorism stuff that we see nowadays, it's not new. We, it was in Vietnam. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think. Oh, so 1975. The war reputedly ends, but as I told you, actually, the North Vietnamese and their few allies, they don't, they're not welcomed as liberators. I don't know if you've ever watched the tanks going to, the, the people that are out there cheering the tanks, is the, if you ever look at it, there's not many of them. And most of them, like, were trucked in. 
you know, from the outside to kind of celebrate the big victory, right? Um, uh, yeah, particularly in Saigon. The, southern, the Saigonese uh, especially didn't, didn't like, most of them tried to get on board the helicopters and get, a, get out to the U.S. Navy. And that's, a, that's maybe another lecture later. Uh, the end of the war and the evacuation that takes place, this huge humanitarian evacuation that takes place, uh, and the main, the main moving part on that is the U.S. Navy. So uh, maybe that's another lecture down the range. So uh, 1975, the next year is 1976, okay? Those are pictures that I took off Vietnam. It's uh, our buddies in a, uh, that's a Soviet Foxtrot submarine down there. That's our buddies in a Prowler aircraft, a jammer aircraft. That's a Soviet cruiser that's based in uh, Cameron Bay. Um, so the way I'm going to end this before I open up for question is, so, you know, I'm a dumb kid. I don't know anything at this time. I, like, I turned 18 the year that the draft is eliminated, 1975, okay? Yeah, I'm that old, okay? So, so I turned 18 in 1975, right, the year that the draft is eliminated. And um, I, I go to college at a place called Miami of Ohio, of all places, because my parents had moved back to uh, Ohio. My roommate was a Vietnamese. His name was Hung Le Ta. Hung Le Ta. And he spoke pretty good English. He spoke a lot better French. I spoke a little French, and I spoke pretty good English too. Um, and I asked Hung, I said, so, you know, were you in the war? And he goes, oh yeah, I was in the war. I go, well, what did you do? And he goes, I was on the small boats in the delta, on the rivers. Um, and he lifted up his shirt, and there's a scar that ran from here to here. And he pulled his shirt down. Thank you very much. I'll take your questions. Yes, sir, in the back. Okay, yeah, um, the, the gloves start to come off. Were you on the uh, Big King or the John King? Uh, the Big King. You were on the Big King, yeah. The Dewey class, right, right. The, D, the, the DLGs, which were more like cruisers, right? Yeah. So, uh, so the gloves come off, all right? And were you on that ship, sir? So you were on that ship. So what was your mission? I was uh, an electronic worker. Okay, so what did you do as an electronic worker? Can you talk about it? Okay, wait a second. They're going to get you a microphone. So the question for everybody is, we have a gentleman who was on the USS King, probably named after Ernie King, in right. the Gulf of Tonkin from 70 to 73, and why ask me when he was on the ship? So I think, we'll, what, what was your experience? My experience, are we on? Yes, sir. We're, yeah, my we're on. My experience was, was positive. Some of you guys probably remember six on, six off. But uh, the USS King uh, was on South Sar, North Sar. We were way, way up north. And um, uh, my reasoning for the question was just a whole other uh, insight. And, and I was in electronic warfare, which was a subset of uh, radar men, which then became operation specialists. And then for pilots, we had uh, NTDS. So we had uh, like eight consoles and... You know, so you guys were probably a Pyras ship, right? Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But, you know, we were out there and we also did naval gunfire support. Uh, for our class of ship, we uh, fire, expended the most uh, rounds, uh, burned out a barrel. But I was just curious what, what your insights were, uh, because that was my time. Um, so you were performing a... a the, the, the nature of the mission had changed? Right. Were, and particularly in 72 with the Easter Offensive and Linebacker, the Navy got very heavily involved in projecting power against North Vietnam. The gloves kind of came off. Ships like this gentleman's ship provided air cover. They also detected SAMs that were ashore and they would do SAMs. They also used their air search radars to pick up enemy MiGs. And I don't know if it was the King, but it was a ship like the King had a tactical action officer. Um, that's the guys that fight the ships in the Navy, or the TAOs. I was a TAO. I went to TAO school. Damn neck Virginia. Yeah. But, uh, 
And, and the TAO on one of these air, uh, air defense ships, because the King was primarily an air defense ship with uh, surface-to-air missiles. She also had five-inch guns, and she could do that mission, but her, her main battery was really her missiles and, and her electronics and her radars. And one of these TAOs on one of these ships, and it may have been the King, uh, actually detected a flight of MiGs that were flying in to, to bushwhack a naval strike that was coming in for linebacker one during the Easter offensive, and launched the missiles from the, from the airship, the surface-to-air missiles, and bushwhacked these planes and shot down a couple MiGs. Uh, it was classified for a long, long time. But the, the interesting thing about it is the tactical action officer was almost court-martialed because he violated the rules of engagement. He didn't have permission to shoot down enemy aircraft over Vietnam with his surface-to-air missiles. Of course, there was a big hubbub about that, and later on they decided, yeah, it's okay to do that if you're protecting American pilots who are about to be bushwhacked by a MiG, by a MiG trap. So, but they're also doing the electronic surveillance, and they're, and they're really helping out the strikes going into and out of. They're doing air control, and when I said Pyraz, a Pyraz ship is a radar picket ship. Think of Okinawa, the idea of the Pyraz developed in Okinawa, where we would put a radar ship out there uh, at the edge of the battle force, and then they would pick up the kamikazes when they came in. So these air defense ships were, were performing a valuable function of making sure that bad enemy aircraft didn't kind of sneak in with the strikes and then try to attack the Americans out at sea. So it was a really, really very useful function. Thank you for performing that. You probably saved a number of lives. Next question. Right in the back here. Wait for the microphone here, sir. <clears throat> Thank you. I noticed you didn't mention too much about carriers. I served uh, in Vietnam aboard the USS Forrestal, and uh, we were on Yankee Station from, I th believe it was uh, middle of 66 through 67. And uh, my brother was a Marine who was in Vietnam, did two tours, received two Purple Hearts, came home, died of Agent Orange, left a family. But nevertheless, him and I were in Vietnam at the same time. Dad calls and says, Skipper calls me, and then he says, your father's on the line. He says, the government people are here. You can't have your only two sons in a combat zone based on the Sullivan bill. And oh, so yeah. yeah. They couldn't decide, so they said, we're going to leave it to you boys. Well, I said, Dad, I'm on a carrier. I'm protected. I'm, I see a destroyer off, a cruiser. I'm sure there's several submarines protected. And then we are a squadron. I was attached to the fighter squadron BF-74. Um, what happened was my brother was a Marine, did two tours. Not only did he say no, but he said, hell no. And he did. He said, I'm staying with my buddies. And he stayed. And so I said, well, I'm protected, Dad. But the funny thing about this, not funny, but... If you know the history of the Forrestal, we caught on fire yep. off the Yankee Station. That was her nickname, And the, the pilot was a young Lieutenant JG in an A-6, single pilot. The belly of that is the gas tank, it developed the leak on the catapult, caught on fire, he ejected, blew up with all the missiles, went down about 14 stories, killed about 144 of our sailors. The pilot was a young Lieutenant JG McCain. He yep. grew up to be Senator McCain. So, yep. but nevertheless, we came off Yankee Station after being there five months, and my question was, were there any other carriers serving out there, or did they send any out? Oh, and yeah. did we ever bomb North Vietnam itself? Yeah, you did. Uh, during linebacker, uh, actually, the Navy carriers actually start flying missions in the early 60s, okay? Uh, officially, 1964. Probably a lot earlier, okay? Um, and some of that may or may not be declassified. The guy to answer your question is a guy named Ed Marolda. But to kind of give you an overview of the carrier, the carrier deal, let's kind of go back and see if we can get a map. So the carriers start regular deployments to Vietnam uh, in the early 60s as, as a forward presence asset, ready for a crisis. Same thing with the Marines. And their, and their amphibious readiness groups. So, so you've usually got at least one amphibious readiness group and one aircraft carrier in the South China Sea already when we start to ramp it up. 
when major conventional operations begin and the Marines land at the Nang, we go to multi-carrier operations in the Gulf. But it's going to really, the carrier operations are really going to stress the Navy to maintain one, two, and sometimes three carriers on Yankee Station. Yankee Station's right here. This is a Yankee Station right here. So there's Yankee Station, there's Haiphong, there's Hanoi, there's Da Nang, okay? Um, and there's MiG bases all up and down here, all right? Um, and so, uh, so beginning at 65, the Navy surges the aircraft carrier fleet to support this operation. But there's a lot of other things going on. There's a Cold War going on. There's requirements for naval presence in the Taiwan Straits. There's requirements for naval presence in the Sea of Japan against the Soviet Union. There's requirements for naval presence in the Mediterranean, okay? So the Navy starts to become very, very, very stressed. But yeah, the Ariskany, the Shangri-La, the, the Forrestal, the uh, Ticonderoga, there's, there's, and most of these ships, Forrestal is a supercarrier from the 50s, but most of these ships are actually converted Essex-class carriers from World War II. All right, and they and and yes, they were designed for the Pacific. All right, but they don't have air conditioning for the most part. Or if they do have air conditioning, it's always broke. I know. I served on the Coral Sea. I was on the last cruise of the Coral Sea in 1989, and uh, we supposedly had air conditioning. So these were miserable conditions for these sailors, and they got tired. And accidents occurred. And again, the Forrestal fire is the most famous fire that occurred, and it was uh, it was catastrophic. That wasn't that was the first of three really catastrophic fires on the Forrestal. Forrestal had a really tough track record with fires. She had another big one later in the 1970s, and then I think she had another one in the 1980s. Um, so thank you for your service. What, what was your rate, sir? I was a yeoman. Okay, so a yeoman, guys, is an administrative man. But you were attached to a fighter squadron. What kind of fighters were they flying? F-4B Phantoms. Yeah, so they were flying. And initially, the F-4 Phantom didn't have a gun. It didn't have a gun. So in the early years of the war, so they had to regun the Phantoms. Did they have the guns by the time you got to them? Yeah, they, had, they finally gunned them up. Yeah, initially, the only uh, Navy fighter jet that had guns was the F-8 Crusader. And it got the nickname of the MiG killer because it had guns and it could shoot the MiG down. Yeah. And uh, all those tactics, when I went through flight training, all the tactics we learned in, in basic flight, uh, combat spread and all that, they were all the Vietnam tactics. So uh, the Navy that I grew up in was basically executing Vietnam tactics. Yes, sir. Okay, wait for the mic. Okay, so this gentleman was on the Forrestal as well? Yes, sir. I was on the USS Repos when the Forrestal caught on fire, and we took on the wounded. We tied up to the USS Fastail, and we took on the wounded and the deceased on the Repos. What kind of ship was the Repos, sir? A hospital ship. Okay, so you are, yeah. That's that was one. a medic. Yeah, okay. So uh, today we have the mercy and the comfort, so we actually had three of them back then, yeah. There's another gentleman back here with a with a hat on, ball cap, navy looking ball cap. I hope it's a navy ball cap. <laughs> I, yes, sir. I served on the USS Constellation of 71. Oh, the Connie. Yes, sir. 71 to 74. I was in a fighter outfit, VF 92. Okay. And in April of 1972, <clears throat> we were sitting in Yokosuka, Japan. We were coming home. We were done. And that's when the North Vietnamese walked away from the peace table. And this infuriated President Nixon, in which he authorized Operation Linebacker. And when we were, went back over to uh, the Gulf of Tonkin, um, we flew missions. Uh, SEAL Team 2 was aboard our ship. And sometimes at night, we would go dead in the water. We would offload the SEAL Team onto a sub. Sub would take them within a mile of the coast. They would swim in and do whatever they wanted to do and then come back. Uh, May 10, 1972 um, is the... Uh, time that uh, um, our sister squadron VF-96 uh, shot down their second, third, fourth, and fifth MiG. Uh, they became the MiG aces of the war from January to uh, May of 72. And that's actually what the movie Top Gun is made about, except they were flying F-4s, not F-14s. Um, but we were in Vietnam in 74, and we were dropping bombs in 74. Oh, you were? Okay. Yes, we were. All right. Uh, so I've we, changed that part of my... The guy back here said they were, somebody over here said they were working six on, six off. We worked 12 on, 12 off. Okay. And um, uh, 
the and that was all the way up to what what time frame in seventy four? We came home in October of seventy four. Yeah. Well, that was Nixon's promise to yeah. Chu was that he would yeah. commit naval power right. if the North Vietnamese <clears throat> uh, violated the terms of the Paris Peace Accords, which they did. But they, on, they May 10th, the on May tenth of seventy two, our SEAL team was in mining the Haiphong Harbor, right? And daylight caught them, and um, so we were flying support for them to swim back out to the sub. Uh, my executive officer, Commander Blackburn, was shot down May 10th, 72. Uh, he and his rear seat, Lieutenant Rudloff. Uh, they were both they both ejected. They both landed on the ground. They were both captured. Uh, in 73, when they released the first wave of POWs, Rudloff came home. Uh, our XO did not come home. Uh, he died somewhere in the process. We don't know how. His remains came home in 86. But I just wanted to clarify that we were we were there uh, still. I'm not sure what we were in calling. 1974. 74, yeah. yeah. No. Okay. Well, the, uh, President Nixon had made some promises. Of course, what happened to President Nixon in 74? Had to resign, right? And President Ford took over. Uh, where did President Ford come from? Anybody remember? Came from Congress, and Congress thinks presidents should do what Congress says. And so, when Ford took over the White House as Republican president, he deferred to Congress because he thought that was the constitutionally correct way to be a president. Well, Congress said, stop this stuff, okay? And so by, I think by 1975, it all had stopped. But it wouldn't surprise me that, that there were missions still going on in 1974. That doesn't surprise me. Being a Navy guy, you know, you always know that there's something else going on. All right, any more, other questions? Yes, sir, right here. Uh, we need the, the mic, if you could hand it to him. This was enlightening for me and I'm sure many of the other vets here because as I think back, as I heard your plans, these were big plans from Nimitz and, and other commanders where we were down here isolated or maybe at Monkey Mountain south of Da Nang, uh, got hit by mortars one night. There was a track vehicle down next to the South China Sea. The guy went to sleep there. They came through there. And local politics, as you kind of mentioned earlier, with the local situation and whether they resist the Vietnamese or the Viet Cong, these sappers that came through were all kids. They were like 16, 17 years old and pretty sure on drugs that hit us that night. And we saw them the next morning. They were, they were just kids. What, what year was that, sir? That was about 68. Okay. We, that makes sense. I had a platoon of amphibious tractors. We went into Hue, not the big Hue deal, but we landed in 68 there and had naval bombardment along the... Yep. Uh, along the perfume. Yeah. 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 On the yeah. outside and all that. Uh, another interesting thing, I was on the USS New Orleans. I believe it was uh, LSD had helicopters up top yep. and our tracks swam out instead of going down the ramp of the LST. But we got hit in the middle of the night. Another